Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this uh, fringe event uh, regarding uh, uh, some anticipation about the uh, fourth report on ethical and sustainable finance in Europe, and uh, um, a report who is, will be de that will be dealing with uh, a number of issues. But uh, uh, I would say um, we uh, can introduce uh, um, the the guests of our of our session. Uh, that are the member of the European Parliament, Simona Bonafè, uh, who, who serves as the vice chair of the Progressive Alliance of Socialist Democrats in uh, Parliament, uh, um, Professor Elisa Giuliani from the University of Pisa, um, and then myself, that uh, I'm now substituting the uh, moderator, uh, who uh, I, I hope will come soon and join us soon. Um, and... Um, uh, I will also present a part of uh, the report on, uh, uh, sustainable, um, on sustainable finance in Europe. And finally, we have Daniel Sorozal, the Secretary General of Ethical Banking Network, uh, FEBEA, uh, the F Federation of European uh, and Ethical Bank in Europe. Um, for those of you participating via the digital platform, please submit your questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab. And last but not least, if you are tweeting about today's session, please use the hashtag uh, slash SOU2021. So, as I said, in today's session, we will be exploring the ways in which uh, ethical banks are different to mainstream banks operating in Europe. This is the first part uh, of uh, the report on uh, um, sustainable and ethical finance in Europe. Um, and then uh, we will talk, first of all, about the characteristics of uh, ethical banks, uh, their strengths, their weaknesses, uh, how they address the issue of uh, human rights and uh, uh, in investment in the environmental field and what the future might look for ethical banks. Um, but first of all, what are ethical banks? We can't take for granted. Uh, all uh, people in the audience knows what uh, know what ethical banks are. It is a broad term which uh, can refer to a wide range of ideas, but at its core, it refers to financial institutions, so banking institutions, who try to make um, money without sacrificing a set of core principles or causing harm. Uh, as a starting point for today's panel, we will be using a comparison study on the difference between, differences between uh, ethical and mainstream banks in Europe. Uh, that was done by Fondazione Banca Etica and a study which I co I'm coordinating. Um, and Fondazione Finanza Etica is the think tank uh, of uh, Italy's Banca Etica group, um, who is also organizing today's panel. Um, this will be the fourth report in the series and is due to be published on, the, on May uh, 22nd. So do keep an eye out for that, and so we are um, anticipating some of the results of the report today. In today's session, we will be exploring uh, actually what makes the difference in uh, uh, ethical banks. So to kick off, uh, I would say we can spend a few minutes walking uh, through our findings and explain what it means for banking customers. So the first uh, striking uh, difference uh, regarding ethical banks is that uh, uh, these banks are uh, have lending uh, as the most important activity. So 76.5% uh, of total assets in 2019 um, were dedicated to lending in ethical banks. And this is accounting uh, for more for almost 60% of assets for cooperative banks, which is a family of banks that is uh, close to ethical banks, why it corresponds to less than half of assets for the European banking system. So ethical banks are very much focused on lending. And on the other side, they are very much focused on taking on deposits from clients. Uh, um, in comparison to the European banking sector, which appears, the, let's say we call them in the report, the mainstream or the mainstream banks, which appears to be more concentrated on other types of activities for, on the, in the, let's say, uh, 
in the in the side of the assets of the of the balance sheet, uh, um, like investment in securities, financial services, participation in companies. Um, this is something that distinguishes the first thing that distinguishes um, ethical banks from uh, mainstream banks. Ethical banks are focused on uh, loans, and uh, on the other side, mainstream banks are more focused on financial services. Um, so we used loans and deposits as a proxy for real economy invest investments. Yeah, uh, in this sense, ethical banks and on the other side, cooperative banks are confirmed to be more dedicated to traditional banking activities. Uh, so collection of savings and granting of loans. And on the other side, uh, they are, uh, it, for this reason, they are closer to the real economy, to the needs of the real economy. Um, while, as I said, mainstream banks are more focused on uh, uh, other services, on financial services. Uh, on the other side, we looked also at the financial performance of ethical banks and cooperative banks as compared to mainstream banks. And uh, uh, the analysis, for example, of uh, return of assets, so uh, ROA over 10 years, shows that European ethical and sustainable banks maintain stable and positive profitability, while cooperative banks have suffered a bit from greater volatility in their results albeit always in positive territory. Um, and uh, at the, on the other side, uh, compared to mainstream bank, mainstream bank have had um, lower ROA. And uh, in, the, um, in the years um, after the financial crisis of uh, 2007, 2008, uh, mainstream banks have suffered more uh, from um, the financial crisis because um, they were much more focused on financial services than ethical banks. So ethical banks and on the other side, cooperative banks, um, they have demonstrated themselves more resilient to crisis because they are more focused on traditional activities, more focused to, um, to the um, traditional core activities of, uh, uh, of, of the banking sector seen as uh, um, from an historical point of view, because uh, uh, banks are actually uh, were born in the Middle Age to meet the interests of uh, people with excess of liquidity, with the desire of uh, people uh, with um, uh, to uh, to invest in a new projects, but with no liquidity. So banks were since the beginning an intermediary between. Uh, um, people in excess uh, uh, of liquidity and people would uh, desperately need liquidity to finance the projects. And ethical banks, and to some extent also cooperative banks, are getting back to the getting back to the roots of banking. And this is why they are more, much more focused on uh, the traditional banking activities, so uh, deposits and loans. This is something that mainstream banks, or let's say also systemic relevant banks are not doing as much as ethical banks. And this is the reason why ethical banks are more resilient in time uh, like, like these and in times of crisis. Um, and this, is, this was basically the first part of the report comparing ethical banks with, uh, and, and, and cooperative banks with the other cluster, with the mainstream banks. And we also compared the growth of the, of the different uh, uh, of the different uh, key figures, so assets and uh, the deposits, loans, uh, net equity, and so on. And, and we saw that uh, also compared to mainstream banks, um, ethical banks, and to some extent also cooperative banks are growing, uh, are growing more. They are a growth uh, story. They are growing by 10% uh, in, uh, on average uh, every year in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, of course, ethical banks still make only a fraction of the banking sector. We're talking about less than 1% of the assets in the banking sector. So they're still a niche um, story. But on the other side, they are a catalyst for pioneering ideas, for pioneering activities in the banking sector. And we see that also, we will see that later uh, with the 
uh, whole action plan, action plan of sustainable finance. Sustainable finance was, until 10 years ago, uh, was pioneered by ethical banks. And now it has uh, become a big issue um, uh, for at European level, uh, uh, thanks to the action plan uh, for sustainable finance of the European Commission. So we don't have to see, uh, I think these banks are uh, as a, a very small niche that is not important to the rest of the banking system. This is, this is also uh, a way, some of, these are some of the conclusions of the report, but we have to see to these relatively small banks in comparison to the mainstream uh, banks as a catalyst for innovation in the banking system. And on the other side, um, uh, there are other issues we have analyzed, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, the fact that deposits are growing much uh, at a much higher pace than, uh, than loans. And this is due to the fact that uh, ethical banks have uh, um, an additional due diligence on their loans because they screen loans, uh, clients of loans, also according to environmental and social criteria. So ethical banks will never finance, for example, the defense industry or big infrastructure projects uh, harming uh, local communities. And so there's a necessity of uh, um, in increased due diligence on the projects. And this makes, uh, um, make makes the pace uh, on which the loans are growing uh, slower than the pace uh, in which deposits are growing. Because of course, it is uh, much easier to accept deposits from clients than to do an in, um, enhanced due diligence uh, to grant loans to the clients. And here we saw also in a report uh, um, some, uh, some points that uh, uh, we would call structural challenges facing ethical banks because they cannot grow so um, quickly on the loans part uh, due to the fact that they need an enhanced due diligence while on the other side they grow much they're growing much more on uh, on deposits and on the other side the last thing i would say about uh, this part of the report is that many ethical banks are earning their uh, their money so they're they're making their profits basically on the interest margin while they are uh, getting much less from uh, much less income from the as i said before from the financial services or from selling investment funds and that is why some of these banks uh, have been suffering after the quantitative easing uh, program of the european central bank uh, starting in 2015 because many of them were relying too much probably on uh, interest rate margins. Uh, so on the difference between uh, passive, uh, um, so active and passive margins. And uh, they were uh, relaying, uh, not relying too much on, uh, uh, on commissions from the sale of, uh, of investment funds or other financial services. So this is also a challenge as we have, uh, as we have seen. But I would also put the same question to Daniel Sosal, uh, who is Secretary General of FEBEA, so it's a federal uh, European um, Association of European and Ethical Banks. Um, what, uh, Daniel, I have quoted some of the challenges facing ethical banks today. What do you think uh, are other challenges that ethical ba banks are facing in the current time? Okay, let's try to be um, to the point because uh, we don't have enough time. Obviously, you mentioned the question of revenue. So considering that ethical banks are mostly based on lending and that interest rates have been very low and probably will be low for quite some time, they're facing a problem with um, generating revenue, which is partly offset by the fact that they're relatively austere type of organizations in, in their in their in their statutes, etc. They, they typically limit the, the remuneration of uh, the highest paid employee versus the lowest paid employee. It's quite a flat type of organization. There are no bonuses or no good remuneration. So their, their type of operation is also more low cost than that of, uh, of larger banks, which somehow compensates that. But there, there is clearly a revenue issue. Uh, but I would maybe uh, touch on, on other aspects that are a bit less financial. Uh, 
I think there is a problem on visibility. Uh, many of these banks, as you said, were pioneers uh, years ago in, for example, in introducing uh, funding to, to the organic farming industry or renewables, etc., which they are much more common. Um, and uh, that visibility is kind of taken away these days because many of their pioneering sectors are now being adopted by the mainstream, which in itself is a good thing, but it hides their work <laughs> partially. Um, Another factor I would touch on is kind of recognition. Um, so a lot of the, the these ethical banks tend to have a regional or sometimes national dimension, but mostly it is regional or, or semi-regional. So they are quite linked to the real economy and they are quite linked to a specific area. So they tend to work somewhere closely to the, to the local authorities uh, and somehow they complement public, public policies in many ways. Uh, policies about local development, about inclusion, about um, uh, innovation. So getting recognition for that work that goes beyond banking, uh, it's something that we've been striving for. And, and I think it's not only deserved, but it would be very useful if you could align much more those interests of public policy with the work of ethical banks in a much more streamlined way. Uh, in Italy, for example, there is a law that recognizes the role of ethical banks, but this is the only place in Europe uh, where that happens. There's an issue around customer base. Um, even if deposits are growing fast, uh, it is relatively hard to acquire, let's say, clients uh, in which to, to, to give loans, considering there is, a, there is a relatively complicated process of assessing not only the social, but also the environmental aspect, as well as the economic aspect. So I think in certain areas, ethical banks are very well covering, let's say, the social economy and third sector. But going beyond that, uh, I think it, it's still a bit of a challenge for them going into, let's say, more SME type of organizations. Um, and maybe in a post-COVID environment in which we, there will be probably a round of uh, difficulties or bankruptcies among just SMEs because of their effects on the economy of the, of the pandemic, maybe we should rethink a little bit the role of ethical banks and go a bit beyond this kind of small world of, of let's say sustainable and, and social uh, type of organizations uh, maybe we should rethink our role uh, so this is getting out of the, of, the, of the comfort zone is not necessarily easy and um, last but not least i think there are many uh, kind of tech-based solutions these days that adopt a similar language and a similar approach in terms of sustainability particularly a bit less social than ethical banks so they're kind of stealing away the discourse but behind there is not always the same philosophy and certainly not the best the, the best practices. However, while we go back to the roots of banking, they are going to the forefront of banking. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a bit hard to compete with organizations that seem very lean, modern, and attractive, particularly to young people. Uh, for ethical banks, that this is a bit of a of something to a bit of a challenge. I think I hope this answers uh, in a nutshell the, the question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. That answers. Uh, um... Uh, the question and uh, um, uh, at the same time I think Khalid uh, our uh, moderator has joined so I would give uh, um, I would give uh, uh, the word to Khalid Khalid uh, please uh, would you would you join our conversation absolutely thank you very much Maru for filling in I really enjoyed listening to you just now I didn't know whether I should step in or not but luckily I've managed to dial in just as we're about to start discussing my favorite topic which is the EU Action Plan on Sustainable Finance. Um, now, because of the sheer scale and complexity of the Action Plan, it would be impossible to go through each of its elements, but, but we'll just start with the basics. So the EU has identified sustainable investments as a key driver to fund the transition to net zero, while also taking care of social and other environmental objectives. However, sustainable investments just aren't growing fast enough, and that's kind of where the EU you know, that's kind of where the action plan steps in. Two of the problems that it's trying to address is number one, uh, there are huge gaps in sustainability data, which makes investors or just um, financial institutions more broadly, it makes it very hard to assess their climate performance. And secondly, there isn't really a clear definition of what actually constitutes a st sustainable investment. Um, so in a practical sense, what this means is you know, as long as you know how to market yourself, you can describe nearly all investment products as sustainable. Um, so what the EU Action Plan does is, firstly, it creates a green taxonomy, which is really a catalogue of all the activities which can be considered green, 
um, and therefore eligible for sustainable investment. And secondly, it introduces disclosure requirements based on that taxonomy across the supply chain. So it covers you know, companies, banks, investors, um, other service providers, uh, so, you know, so we can get some, some uh, consistency across the page. Uh, there are obviously other elements to the action plan, but I think this should be enough for, for today's discussion. In terms of the specific requirements facing banks, um, firstly, banks will have to report their green asset ratio or the value of loans, advances and debt securities, which are aligned to, to the taxonomy. And there are also other kind of reporting metrics um, which relate to advisory fees, uh, trading books, um, off balance sheet uh, exposures um, um, and, and others. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that these are still provisional. Uh, the European Commission will still decide what to take forward by the, at the end of the year. Um, but I think it gives a good indication of the direction of travel. Um, for this bit of the discussion, I'd like to bring in Simona Bonafé uh, to get a sense of how, how Parliament is, is thinking about these proposals. Uh, Simona, how will the EU Action Plan help make the banking sector more sustainable? Uh, well, um, thank you, uh, Khalid. You have already said uh, a lot and this permit me to be brief. Uh, uh, but first of all, let me thank you for, for inviting me to take part to this panel debate. It is now uh, many years that my parliamentary activity is dedicated to the transition to a sustainable uh, economic model. And uh, it is always inspiring to, to have the opportunity to exchange views with organizations such as uh, Fondazione Finanza Etica. So let's go now to the point, the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. Uh, as Maggiolaro said, this is a big project, of course. Uh, this is a dynamic plan that uh, started in 2018 uh, under the Juncker uh, Commission and was recently uh, enriched with new proposal um, that has been presented uh, on, the uh, on the 21st of, of April. So uh, it's a very recent uh, um, update of, of this plan. Uh, we have started in 2018 with three regulations, uh, the taxonomy, the disclosure and the benchmarks. And uh, a few weeks ago, the, the commission moved forward by presenting the first two uh, taxonomy dele de delegated acts, uh, a proposal for a corporate sustainability reporting directive and uh, six amending delegated acts on uh, uh, fiduciary duties. Uh, we, we, we expect still more initiatives during this legislature, uh, starting from a proposal uh, for a EU green uh, bond standard uh, and uh, concrete steps uh, ahead from the European Commission uh, on the social uh, taxonomy. Um, the main goal of, of the world package, of the world strategy, of the world uh, finance, uh, sustainable finance action plan is to help to improve the, the flow of money towards sustainable activities across the European Union. Uh, the starting point is that the investment gap uh, for green and social activities and infrastructure for implementing EU policy goals is uh, huge. Just some numbers. Uh, before the COVID crisis, the estimates were 180 billion to meet our climate target and 140 billion yearly only for social infrastructure. Um, so we, we need to reorient the, 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 the investment towards a more sustainable technologies, businesses and, and activities and the action plan uh, wants to support this, uh, uh, this uh, necessity. Um, everything has been done at European level. Uh, of course, no. Let me say that a lot has been done, but we still have a lot of work to do to implement the economic and financial framework, all the three aspects of sustainability, because we have concentrated above all on the environmental sustainability, but uh, you, we know that uh, the sustainability has three dimensions. Yeah, of course, the environmental one, but also the social one, and that one related to the governance aspects. Um, the, 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 the first step of the EU action plan are still mainly dedicated to the green dimension, uh, 
And I may say that uh, we lost the battle in, in Parliament uh, to introduce from the beginning in the, in the action, in EU action planning taxonomy above all, the social dimension. Um, of course, clarifying which uh, uh, economic activities contribute to meeting the EU environmental objective and defining how to measure them in order to avoid the, uh, the phenomenon of, of green, greenwashing is uh, up to now the strongest innovation introduced. Um, the, uh, as you correctly uh, mentioned before, the, the current of this process is, of course, the EU taxonomy regulations. Uh, uh, that is a science-based uh, transparent uh, tool for companies and investors. Uh, and this classification creates a common language uh, that investors can use when investing in any project and any uh, economic uh, activities. Indeed, this set of technical screening criteria and thresholds uh, we, will apply to all financial products and therefore in the capital market. Uh, now, beyond financial products, uh, how will this affect banks and how will this encourage them to put savers money in the sustainable activities uh, and possibly in the real economy is the, the very question that we want to answer. And we can say that the regulation is not only not only defines uh, uh, metrics for financial products, but also it has been said before uh, introduced disclosure obligations on companies and financial market participants, uh, uh, including banks. Uh, if I could have more time, I could enter into details, but uh, let me uh, only say because the, the because. Um, the time is full for me. Let me only say that uh, um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, these are still uh, um, provisionals uh, and the commission uh, has to decide, uh, um, ne needs to propose other elements uh, that goes in the direction also in the taxonomy on the social dimension. And uh, um, we, 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 of course, uh, a need uh, in the next uh, months to uh, understand the better uh, what the Commission will present on the social aspects, because in, uh, in, until the end of 2021, the Commission needs to present uh, these, uh, also these, uh, these aspects. Uh, let me say that the Greens transition is important, uh, is not a speculative trick. Uh, it requires a deep uh, transformation of our uh, real economy, uh, where banks uh, um, always have an important role, in particular towards the financing of SMEs and uh, households that are the backbone of the whole economy and the cornerstone of our uh, social model. So uh, we will continue to keep a very high attention on these points because are central for uh, the, the, the recovery of our economies after the COVID crisis. Thank you very much, Simona. Um, very comprehensive explanation and, and hopefully if we're lucky, we'll get to maybe discuss um, that social ta taxonomy um, later on. But for now, let's, uh, let's, let's bring the practitioners into the discussion. Uh, Daniel, um, do you think you know, some of these uh, new measures under the action plan will bring new growth opportunities for ESCO banks? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I think that at the moment, disclosure that is kind of limited to, to green only for the moment, or mostly to green only, it's more of an opportunity for greenwashing than anything. At least this is our perspective. And for us, that means a bit of a threat because we've been doing sustainable finance in a holistic sense for quite some time. And now we will have competitors that will kind of label whatever they want uh, as green and probably promoted <laughs> with a much bigger um, loudspeaker than, than what we have as small organizations. Um, also, I think the link of, of whatever is uh, labeled as sustainable these days is still a bit thin in, in terms of linking it to the real economy. Typically, ethical banks, as Mauro mentioned, are very focused on, fo on, on finance in the real economy, on, fo on finance in social economy, on finance in and financial inclusion, mm -hmm. etc. However, um, from the moment that a green bond traded in the markets 
that is not necessarily linked to the real economy will be also labeled as, as sustainable in the future. We might be comparing apples and pears, and in principle, both will be sustainable, but not exactly the same kind of sustainable. So I think there are levels of sustainable here, and it's not a bit clear who's where. Um, there is also kind of a focus on, on, on disclosure on single products uh, that can be very good themselves, but not necessarily on the whole organization. So I think it makes it relatively easy for certain banks or financial institutions to kind of disclose with the right hand what they're doing right, but hide with the left one what they're doing wrong. Um, because we are not looking at the whole organization as sustainable, but a specific product as specific products are sustainable. So you could have, a, for example, a bank that is financing a reforestation project somewhere. And at the same time, the same bank or another department can be financing an agricultural uh, producer who's actually contributing to deforestation. Same organization, but in a kind of uh, dystopic way, the, the, the right hand doesn't know what the left does. And yet it can still be labeled as a sustainable financial, finance, finance organization. So I think there's a number of risks there. Um, maybe another thing that, that, that we are, to sum it up in a way, we think that sustainability, and Ms. Bonafé said it very clearly, should be understood as a kind of 360 degree concept. No? So, so we have to understand sustainability as economic, environmental, and social. Um, and at the moment, as long as we only have a partial taxonomy, uh, we're not there. And at the same time, the taxonomy is trying to say today what is uh, sustainable and to a certain extent what is green, uh, whereas it is not saying what is not green or what is not sustainable. And I think having lacking that leaves a lot of leeway for, let's say, innovation, uh, which might not be necessarily to the benefit of, of, of society or the planet. Um, so I think as much as we need a list of, of activities or products that are clearly sustainable and, and included in the definition, we also need clearly a list of exclusion uh, activities that cannot be uh, included in a sustainable finance definition. And until, until there is not that clarity, greenwashing will be the norm. So for us, if, there, if the definition stays in a kind of minimum approach, it means just more competition, kind of a bit unfair. If the definition evolves, it means a real opportunity to kind of switch to a much more sustainable economy and a sustainable financing mechanism. I don't know if that addresses fully the question. But, uh, no, I, I think I well, I think you've made a great start. You know, there, 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 there are some very interesting points there on the importance of you know institutional con um, consistency. Um, maybe we'll have an opportunity to go into that um, in. In the in in the next um, uh, slot, which I'll introduce now, um, we've got we're lucky to have um, soon to be released research from Professor Elisa Giuliani from the University of Pisa, um, who's just done research on how banks uh, perform on human rights. Professor, can you talk uh, talk us through some of your uh, talk us through your research and some of the headline findings? Yes, every, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, to this important talk today. Uh, so let me summarize the project I coordinated here at the University of Pisa. Um, uh, the, the goal of this project was to develop a transparent and replicable methodology to measure the level of involvement of the financial sector into violations of human rights. Human rights defined by the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights and made relevant for the business sector by the 2011 UN Guiding Principles, which apply to the business sector and, of course, more narrowly as well to the financial sector. So before I go into more technical details of our Banks and Human Rights Index, let me just say what that our analysis considered a sample of 178 banks from all over the world uh, analyzed and observed over the period 2000-2015. Uh, and my team has scanned through evidence of alleged involvement of uh, these banks in human rights violations using different sources, starting from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. So we find that 26% of the banks in our sample was involved in at least one human rights violation event for a total of 180 bank year violations over the period of observation. And we observe three types of violations in our data set. One typology includes violations perpetrated directly by the bank itself, as uh, for instance, in the case of discriminations at work. For example, if the bank discriminates against women or Russian minorities in its hiring practices. 
And we find that out of 180 uh, recorded violations, 41 uh, are of this kind, 22%. Uh, another set of violations fall into a second typology of abuses where it is not the bank itself to have abused human rights, but a third party actor, another firm or a client uh, that has a business relationship with the bank. So here the bank is not the perpetrator of the abuse, but it has directly contributed by incentivizing practices that lead the third party actor to abuse human rights. As in the case, for instance, of a bank financing an infrastructure uh, or a project uh, where, and then putting cost cutting pressure on the client, knowing that this could harm human rights, for instance, by exacerbating the health conditions of the local communities. And we find that there are some 20% of the uh, events in our data set that correspond to this typology. And then finally, the majority of cases, which amount to 55% of the violations that we observe, fall in a third group, uh, which is uh, basically a group of violations that are only linked to the bank. And this refers to situations where the bank has not caused nor directly uh, contributed to an adverse human rights impact, but it has nevertheless a direct link between the operations, products and services of the bank and an adverse uh, impact on human rights through the bank's business relationship. So for example, a bank that has provided finance to a client, the, the client uses that financial resources given by the bank in projects that have adverse uh, human rights impacts. So as compared to the earlier case, uh, here there's no evidence of the bank uh, incentivizing the adverse impact, but nonetheless, the funding provided is uh, connected to the abusive behavior. Uh, so uh, in the project, we have considered all these qualitative evidence and turned them into a quantitative indicator, which we call the Banks and Human Rights Index. And it's an indicator that ranges from zero to 100, uh, where basically banks closer to 100 are those that are more exposed to human rights violations. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of this methodology, which is fully available at our Banking on Human Rights website, but I wanted to mention that our approach conditions the raw data on banks' involvement in alleged violations of human rights on the different levels of exposures of the banks to the media and to NGO scrutiny, because we know that there is a huge difference. Some banks are overreported, others are completely uh, underreported. And so we, uh, condition for this uh, kind of heterogeneity that can be observed across banks. And also we condition for the time trend because we know that there is an important time trend in the observation of abuses. They increase over time uh, in the banking industry, in other industries we have analyzed at, at our research center. Uh, and this is due to the fact that there is growing interest on monitoring and reporting human rights connected to the business sector. And there is also greater availability of this information through the social media. So uh, clearly this is, uh, uh, this is what we um, basically, um, when we uh, develop our index, we basically try to make it comparable across, uh, across firms and across time. And that's why our methodology is particularly uh, useful and can be replicated, it's transparent, so there is no appropriability there or no like uh, magic as it happens sometimes with ESG measures. So um, uh, based on the codification of our evidence, uh, our human rights, uh, banks and human rights index shows that the most exposed banks worldwide uh, are to human rights on the period of observations are Standard Chartered Bank, PNB, Paribas, Wealth Fa Wells Fargo, BlackRock and, and Morgan Stanley. Uh, there are many others. And of course, these ratings are relative to the sample that we observe and we consider for the study, not our they're not in absolute term the worst bank in, in terms of exposure to human rights violations. I can also add that after uh, the 2008 financial crisis, there has, uh, there we record an increase in the average value of the index, which is driven by the increasing involvement uh, in human rights violations by banks originating from emerging uh, economies. So as these banks are growing and they're growing relevant internationally, we also notice that um, a lot of the uh, increase in the index is actually uh, on the side of these kind of uh, uh, financial institutions. Thanks, Professor. I think these are very interesting findings. Um, but, but I guess the subsequent question to ask is, now that we have this information, what can we do about it? Well, uh, the better information one has, the more one will be able to control events, right? 
And so I think that having better access and better quality information on banks' involvements on human rights uh, violations would improve our knowledge of this phenomenon and analysis uh, like the kind we have carried out, which could be replicated or done uh, on, on different samples and by different uh, uh, scholars or groups uh, could also allow for a better assessment of the progress that is being achieved by the banking sector in this front. So my sense is that the financial industry, as was said before, I mean, it's uh, very much now concentrated on climate change and environmental issues, and it's just started, starting to scratch the surface of the banks and human rights issues. We're just at the level of uh, very basic commitment. And, but I'm sure, I mean, I sense that there's a growing awareness and this will become the next key topic for the banking industry. So uh, banks like manufacturing are, are sensible to external pressures. And the more you provide data about uh, their monitoring or that uh, in, in a way is able to assess what they're doing or to monitor what they're doing, the more they are going to act and react uh, to it because this is clearly becomes a reputational issues for them. And I'm sure that they have all the resources to address these issues in a proper way. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And, and if anyone else is interested to uh, uh, to, to go through um, the professor's uh, research, um, you can uh, go to bankingonhumanrights.org. Um, I would highly recommend it. Uh, we now move on to the audience uh, Q&A section of this evening with about a fair amount of uh, 10, 10 or so minutes left to go. Um, our first question co comes from Flora, who's, a, who's an alum, alumnus of the UI. Um, she asks, um, do you think ethical banking should be an alternative to mainstream banking, or should it become an inter integral part of it? Um, and if so, is this realistic, or might it create room for new forms of shadow banking? Um, I'd like to ask Daniel if, um, if that's all right. Daniel, what do you say to that? Well, I think today, considering its size, it's still at the level of the alternative. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, as Mauro well said in the beginning, it's at the level of pioneering in certain areas where mainstream banking might just follow later. So I think that role is, fits as well and we're comfortable with that. In, in regards to, to, to the risk of, of opening kind of room for shadow banking, I think considering the, the, the level of assessment and the level of, let's say, requirements that ethical banks impose on themselves in terms of the charter, their governance, and so on, I think the risk is pretty much nil. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but, but yeah. Absolutely. I, I think those are interesting uh, perspectives. Mauro, would you like to add to that, or should, should we move on? Um, perfectly agree with, uh, with Daniel. I would just add that uh, um, we have noticed in our study that in the last 10 years, uh, actually, uh, mainstream banks, uh, after the financial crisis, they have become gradually more similar to ethical banks, uh, at least as far as their financial structure is concerned. So their, um, the percentage of their loans and on total assets and of deposits on total liabilities has significantly increased for mainstream banks in the last 10 years, even if uh, the gap between the two groups remain. But this means, this means that uh, um, mainstream banks have seen that uh, there's, a, uh, let's say, uh, there's a reason to, uh, to become closer, to get closer to traditional banking, because you can get more resilient, you can get closer to your clients. And this at least is a message that has, uh, uh, let's say, has passed. So also... Uh, also, mainstream banker, to some to some extent, they're getting back to to the roots of bank. Okay, interesting uh, point. Uh, our next question comes from an audience member who asks, um, "How does ethical banking differ from uh, ethical finance in Islam?" Um, Maru, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I think uh, um, let's say um, I would say that. Uh, Contemporary uh, Islamic uh, financial practices, uh, uh, for some, to some extent, they can be considered. Uh, so, Islamic finance can be considered to some extent as inherently ethical, uh, because they are. It is governed by universal and divine legal and moral principles and standards related to economic trans transactions. However, 
uh, contemporary Islamic financial practices are often strongly criticized for giving um, precedence uh, to legal forms over ethical substance and for the rising gap between moral ideas and practical realities. Uh, on the other side, it, is, it has been observed in some studies, on the other side, the ethical finance is uh, actually um, a conscious effort to reform finance and it embraces environmental, socially, mm. and morally conscious practices. So uh, I think that, um, um, I would say that from, uh, Ethical banks uh, are uh, completely dedicated to sustainable businesses, while on the other side, uh, uh, Islamic banks are uh, sometimes not completely dedicated to sustainable business, but they are um, actually um, strongly, they have a strong adherence to uh, legal and moral principles. So this is the main difference, I would say. Absolutely. I myself have, have written about Islamic finance, so if anyone in the audience would like to learn more about that, feel free to contact me directly. I'm afraid we haven't, we do not have time to talk about the social taxonomy, I'm afraid, uh, Simona. Um, but, you know, there'll be, anyone who's interested can either contact me and the EU have all the appropriate resources as well. Um, I guess there's nothing left to do but to thank all of our speakers today. Um, and you, our audience, for watching, and stay tuned for the next panel, which will be discussing uh, the geopolitics of EU enlargement and democracy, starting in about five minutes at 7.50 p.m. TET. Um, sounds very interesting. See all of you there. Goodbye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.